Ananath Obisekera begins by quoting from Brown and Harris's influential 1978 study of the social origins of depression in women. Brown and Harris characterize depression as follows, I'm quoting, the immediate response to loss of an important source of positive value is likely to be a sense of hopelessness accompanied by a gamut of feelings ranging from distress, depression, and shame to anger. Feelings of hopelessness will not always be restricted to the provoking incident, large or small. It may lead to thoughts about the hopelessness of one's life in general. It is such generalization of hopelessness that we believe forms the central core of depressive disorder. Uh, end quote. And to this, Obeyasekera responds, this statement sounds strange to me, a Buddhist, for if it was placed in the context of Sri Lanka, I would say that we are not dealing with a depressive, but a good Buddhist. The Buddhist would take one step further in generalization. It is not simply the general hopelessness of one's own lot. That hopelessness lies in the nature of the world, and salvation lies in understanding and overcoming that hopelessness. End quote. Now, one may want to quibble with Obeyasekera. One might demand more evidence, both psychological and ethnographic, for the similarities he sees between good Sri Lankan Buddhists and American depressives. Do Sri Lankan Buddhists really aspire to a state that we would associate with depression? Or is the very idea of depression so culturally and historically constructed as to mitigate its cross-cultural utility? However one parses these issues on purely doctrinal grounds, Obesekra seems to have a point. Early Buddhist sutras in general and Theravada teachings in particular hold that, number one, to live is to suffer, and number two, that the only genuine remedy to suffering is escape from samsara, or the phenomenal world, and three, that escape requires, among other things, abandoning hope that happiness in this world is possible. Traditional Theravada descriptions of the insight that emerges from Buddhist practice presents a view of the world that can look quite stark. I'm thinking here of, of Buddha Gosa's uh, expositions of the eight stages of insight that immediately precede enlightenment, stages such as knowledge, knowledge of dissolution, knowledge of appearance as terror, knowledge of danger, and so on. It, um, people haven't paid enough attention to this, I think. Obis, uh, or, Buddhaghosa is this very important uh, commentator and really uh, it's foundational for the modern Satipatthana movement when he describes the affect associated with these very advanced stages. He compares it to a mother who is watching her three sons being executed. Right? That's the affective state. Yet today Buddhist wisdom is touted as the very antithesis of depression. Rather than eliciting an urge to escape the world, Buddhism is seen as a science of happiness, as a way of easing the pain. Buddhist practice, in turn, is reduced to meditation, and meditation is reduced to mindfulness, which is touted as an empirically validated means of living a more emotionally fulfilling and rewarding life. Mindfulness is promoted as a cure-all for anxiety and affective disorders, including post-traumatic stress syndrome, for alcoholism and drug dependencies, for attention deficit disorder, for antisocial and criminal behavior, and for the plain old debilitating stress of modern urban life. Now there's a robust literature now on Buddhist modernism, so I'm not gonna rehearse that subject here, um, except to say that many scholars of Buddhism now concur, not all, but many, that the view of Buddhism as a science of happiness emerged out of a complex intellectual exchange between Asia and the West that took place over the course of the last 150 years or so. But only recently have scholars focused on the particular meditation practices associated with Buddhist modernism. Much of this focus has been on the interpretation of sati, or mindfulness, as bare attention by which is meant a sort of non-judgmental, non-discursive attending to the here and now. Some scholars have argued that the widespread understanding of mindfulness as bare attention has its roots in the meditation, the Theravada meditation revival of the 20th century, a movement that drew its authority, if not its content, from the two Satipatthana scriptures, or the scriptures on establishing mindfulness, 
as well as Buddhaghosa's Path of Purification and a handful of other Pali sources. The specific techniques that came to dominate the Satipatthana or Vipassana or insight movement as it came to be known were developed by a handful of Burmese teachers in the lineages of Lady Sayadaw and Mingun Jetavana Sayadaw. And it was Mingun's disciple, Mahasi Sayadaw, who developed the technique that is best known today, a way of focusing on whatever object arises in the moment-to-moment -moment flow of consciousness. Mahasi designated this method, or designed this method, with laypersons in mind, including those with little or no prior exposure to Buddhist doctrine or liturgical practice. Perhaps most radical was Mahasi's claim that advanced skill in concentration, or shamatha, leading to states of trance, was not necessary to develop liberative insight. Instead, Mahasi placed emphasis on the notion of sati, understood as a lucid, non-reactive, non-judgmental awareness of whatever happens to be arising in the mind. One of Mahasi's most influential students, the German-born monk Nyanopanika Terra, coined the term bear attention for this mental faculty, and this rubric took hold through his popular 1954 book, The Heart of Buddhist Meditation. Western Buddhist enthusiasts may have a hard time appreciating just how radical Mahasi's method was in its own day. Designed to be accessible to laypersons, it did not require familiarity with Buddhist literature, most notably with Abhidhamma. It did not require the renunciation of lay life, and it could be taught in a relatively short period of time in a retreat format. And all of this made it easy to export. It has been astonishingly influential not only in the Southeast Asian Theravada world, but also among Tibetan, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and Vietnamese religious reformers. By the end of the 20th century, Mahasi's approach to mindfulness, with understood in this way as bare attention, or living in the here and now, has emerged as one of the foundations of Buddhist modernism, an approach to Buddhism that cuts across geographical, cultural, sectarian, and social boundaries. As much has been written of late about this term sati, or the Sanskrit is smirti, I'm only going to touch upon it here. Smirti originally meant to remember, or to recollect, or to bear in mind. Its religious significance is sometimes traced to the Vedic emphasis on setting to memory the authoritative teachings of the tradition. Sati appears to retain the sense of remembering in the Buddhist Nikayas. I'm quoting, or the, these are the uh, early sutras in Pali. What bhikshus, or monks, is the faculty of sati? Here, O oh monks, the noble disciple has sati. He is endowed with perfect sati and intellect. He is one who remembers, who recollects what has been done and has said, been said long before, end quote. Moreover, the faculties of recollection and reflection are unarguably central to a variety of classical Buddhist practices associated with sati, including Buddha Anusmirti, or the recollection on the Buddha, which typically involves some combination of recalling the characteristics of the Buddha, visualizing him, and chanting his name. And even in the Satipatthana Sutta, or the scripture on the foundations um, or establishing mindfulness, the term sati retains it the sense of recollecting or bearing in mind. Specifically, it involves bearing in mind the virtuous dharmas so as to properly apprehend from moment to moment the true nature of phenomena. Or at least this is the explanation found in early Pali exegetical works such as the Melinda Panha and the commentaries of Buddhaghosa. Uh, the scholar Rupert Gethin has undertaken a careful analysis of such pa passages and notes that sati cannot refer to remembering in any simple sense of the word, since memories are, as Buddhists are quick to acknowledge, subject to distortion. Rather, sati should be understood, and here I'm quoting from Rupert, uh, understood as what allows awareness of the full range and extent of the dhammas. The dhammas are just... Uh, basically phenomena as they arise moment to moment to moment, what is actually there. Sati is an awareness of things in relation to things and hence an awareness of their relative value. 
applied to the foundations of mindfulness, presumably this means that sati is what causes the practitioner of yoga to remember that any feeling he may experience exists in relation to a whole variety or world of feelings that may be skillful or unskillful, with faults or faultless, relatively inferior or refined, dark or pure. That's end quote. In short, there's little bear about the faculty of sati since it entails, among other things, the proper discrimination of the moral valence of phenomena as they arise. There are, in addition, philosophical objections to construing sati as bare attention. The popular understanding of bare attention presumes that it is possible to disaggregate pre-reflective sensations, or what contemporary philosophers might refer to as raw feels, or qualia, from perceptual experience writ large. In other words, there's an assumption that our recognition of and response to an object is logically and or temporally preceded by an unconstructed or pure impression of said object that can be rendered, at least with mental training, available to conscious experience. Mindfulness practice is then a means to quiet the ongoing chatter of the mind and to keep to the bare registering of the facts observed. That's a quote from Nyanapanika. Now, specifically, this notion of mindfulness as bare attention is tied to an epistemological model that Daniel Dennett calls the Cartesian theater, theater and Richard Rorty dubs the mirror of mind, wherein mind is understood as a kind of tabula rasa or clear mirror that passively registers sensations prior to any recognition, judgment, or response. The notion of a conscious state devoid of conceptualization or discrimination is not unknown to Buddhist exegetes. Indeed, later Yogacara texts posit a state of non-conceptual cognition that operates by means of direct perception. And the imagery of the mirror is often used to illustrate the relationship between pure mind and defiled object. This state is sometimes understood as preceding or undergirding the arising of conceptualization or as an advanced stage of attainment tantamount to awakening. But while the notion of non-conceptual cognition became important in some Yogacara systems, uh, and not to mention Tibetan Dzogchen, it remains at odds with the Theravadan analysis of mind and perception. In Theravada Abhidharma, for those of you who don't know, Theravada is uh, the sort of Buddhist world out of which um, uh, Bur Bur Burma is part of the Theravada world, and this Satipatthana or mindfulness movement that I'm talking about really came out of Burma. So it's this kind of um, clash that I'm talking about here. In Theravada Abhidharma, or Theravadan philosophy, cognition is intentional in the Husserlian sense, insofar as consciousness and its object er emerge codependently and are phenomenologically inextricable, which is to say the objects of experience emerge not upon some pre-existent tabula rasa, but rather within a cognitive matrix that includes affective and discursive dispositions occasioned by one's past activity. That's one's karma. The elimination of these attendant dispositions doesn't yield some non-conceptual awareness so much as the cessation of consciousness itself. And arguing along similar lines, Paul Griffiths suggests that the closest thing to a state of unconstructed or pure experience in classical Indian literature is Nirodha Samapati, a state in which both objects and conscious experience cease altogether. It's a kind of vegetative coma. In such a framework, it seems misleading to construe any mode of attention or perception as bare. And in short, the psychological model behind Nyanapanika's understanding of sati as bare attention may owe more to internalist and empiricist epistemologies than it owes to early Buddhist or traditional Theravada formulations. Nyana Panika, by the way, was a student of phenomenology. He was a German student of phenomenology before he went off and became a Buddhist monk, which I find interesting. Now, given the ambiguities surrounding sati, 
or mindfulness, it's not surprising that the Mahasi method quickly came under fire from a number of quarters, including both Theravada traditionalists in Southeast Asia and practitioners and scholars in the West. Now, in brief, critics object to Mahasi's devaluation, number one, of concentration techniques leading to jhana or, or absorption, Number two, to claims that practitioners of the Mahasi method are able to attain advanced states of the path in remarkably short periods of time. And three, the ethics of rendering sati as bare attention, which would seem to devalue or neglect the importance of ethical judgment. Now, in my own work on the roots of the Zen tradition in 8th century China, I found that certain early Zen teachers seemed to have turned away from the traditional forms of meditation uh, that were current in, in their day, repentance practices, meditations on corpses and on the impurity of the body and so on. And in favor, they instructed their disciples to simply set aside all distinctions and conceptualizations and allow the mind to come to rest in the flow of the here and now. In other words, they were coming up with something that is remarkably similar, at least on the surface, to uh, the modern Burmese approach to sati. It may not be a coincidence that the teachers who advocated this new style of practice were also those who had garnered a sizable lay audience, an audience that had little interest in monastic renunciation and little background in Buddhist doctrine. So these early Zen techniques which were known by terms such as viewing the mind or discerning mind or reflecting without an object. They were like bare attention seen as direct approaches that circumvented the need for traditional dhyanic or meditative attainments or for mastery of scripture and doctrine and for proficiency in monastic ritual. In brief, this early Zen technique revolved around a seemingly simple figure ground shift wherein attention is shifted away from the objects of any kind toward the abiding luminosity of mind or awareness itself. The early Zen reformers, like the, Buddhist re the Burmese reformers of the last century, were popularizers. They touted a method that was simple, promised quick results, and could be cultivated by anyone in a short period of time. Indeed, one of the early Zen texts actually, one early Zen text actually traces the technique back to a layman, layman Fu. This is actually the fourth patriarch, Dao Xin. When he's asked where did he learn this from, he says he learned it from layman Fu. Again, I find that um, mind boggling. Uh, early Zen was not the only pre-modern Buddhist tradition that seems to have a notion like bare attention. One can find it, as I mentioned, in Tibetan Dzogchen as well, which is not surprising as there's some evidence that Dzogchen was itself influenced directly from Chinese Zen. And I don't want to get into the thorny issue of whether there's a common phenomenological referent or meditative state behind these traditions. Rather, I would draw attention to the institutional and sociological parallels, to the fact that these early Zen patriarchs, like the contemporary Burmese counterparts, were interested in developing a method simple enough to be accessible to those unschooled in Buddhist doctrine and scripture, who were not necessarily wedded to classical Indian cosmology, who may not have had the time or the inclina inclination for extended monastic practice, and who were interested in immediate results, as opposed to incremental advancement over countless lifetimes. It is thus not surprising that the early Zen teachers found themselves in the same position as Mahasi, castigated for dumbing down the tradition, for devaluing ethical training, for misconstruing or devaluing the role of wisdom, and for their crassly instrumental approach to practice. So I would suggest that those who are interested in the empirical study of mindfulness might pay some attention to these classical criticisms. The tongue master Matsu Daoi, for example, was noted for his rejection of the more scholastic interests of the monks in his day, and he's particularly associated with the idea of a sudden, almost spontaneous realization of one's Buddha nature, or true mind. But Zongmi, another great Tang master and one of the chroniclers of early Zen, had deep misgivings about this technique. 
He believed that Matzah's method, which consisted, according to Tsongmi, of giving free reign to the mind, and now allowing the mind to do as it will, failed to distinguish between right and wrong. Indeed, a common criticism was that the excessive, focuses, the excessive focus on meditation as inner stillness, especially when unbalanced by an engagement with the scriptures, leads to a, disgrace, a, a state that they call falling into emptiness. And it's also called meditation sickness, zenbyo, uh, chanbing. Meditation sickness is associated precisely with techniques that emphasize inner stillness. A, source of, a sort of non-critical, non-analytical, non-discursive presentness. Today we might translate meditation sickness as zoning out. I don't know. I don't, and I don't mean by that being lost in thought or daydreaming. Rather, falling into emptiness or meditation sickness can refer to an intense immersion in the moment, in the now, such that one loses touch with the socially, culturally, and historically constructed world in which one lives. One loses touch with the web of social relations that are the touchstone of our humanity as well as our sanity. The trick to avoiding this is to learn to see both sides at once. This is according to Tsongmi. Tsongmi says, I'm quoting, while awakening from delusion is sudden, the transformation of an unenlightened person into an enlightened person is gradual, end quote. From a more traditional Buddhist perspective, what is missing in the modern mindfulness movement is precisely this transformation, which involves active engagement with the Buddhist teachings. This engagement with Buddhist doctrine is often rejected by modern advocates of mindfulness who believe they can garner the rewards of Buddhist practice without having to adopt a Buddhist worldview. Indeed, some insist that Buddhist practice doesn't entail a worldview at all. Rather, it is a process, rather than being a process of reconditioning, they insist that Buddhist meditation, properly understood, is a process of unconditioning, of setting aside are culturally constructed notions about the world so as to see things as they really are. The object, they believe, is to put an end to the ceaseless inner chatter of the mind, to stop thinking. Jill Bolt Taylor's book and famous TED video, A Stroke of Insight, have people seen that or familiar with that? Um, in any case, it perfectly captures this. She experienced what she believes is a taste of Buddhist nirvana as the result of a massive stroke that shut down the linguistic centers of her left hemisphere. I submit, however, that there is indeed a metaphysical commitment that undergirds this approach to Buddhist meditation. In other words, it's not deconditioning at all. Namely, an uncritical commitment to what scholars of religion call perennialism. Perennialism is the notion that there is some singular transcultural, transhistorical experience common to many mystics around the globe. This experience is in itself unconstructed. That is, it is free of local cultural, linguistic, or social inflections, although such inflections invariably color any descriptions or analyses of such a state. More specifically, mindfulness is associated, I believe, with a specific model of perennialism, sometimes called the filter theory. This theory, is so, this theory, which is vividly illustrated in Bolt Taylor's narrative, holds that our normal sensory and discursive processes, rather than opening us to reality, actually serve to filter reality out. Uh, Kamala Sheila, who was a um, great Indian, um, master in his critique of the northern Zen master, Hushang um, Mohoyen, in the 8th century, pointed out that there is a particular place, a kind of hell, for heterodox yogis who erroneously believe that the goal of meditation is not thinking. And it is the realm of beings without minds, <laughs> who after death spend 500 eons as mindless zombies. Just as there are a set of metaphysical commitments that undergird the modern mindfulness movement, there are also ethical and political commitments. The problem is that, in America at least, these commitments so resemble those of mainstream consumer culture that they go largely unspoken. 
Note that, in the early period at least, the Buddhist institution embodied a critique of mainstream social and cultural values. It held that liberation was not possible without a radical change in the way one lived. It enjoined renunciation, or monasticism, opting out of family ties and worldly pursuits, and opting into an alternative, communal, celibate, and highly regulated lifestyle. Modern teachers of mindfulness rarely make such demands of their students. The liberative, or if you will, therapeutic benefits do not require dramatic changes in the way one lives. Rather than enjoining renunciation of carnal and sensual pleasure, mindfulness is touted as a way to more fulfilling sensual experiences. Rather than enjoining turning away from mainstream American culture, mindfulness is seen as a way to better cope with it. There may be no better exemplar of this ethically dubious and politically reactionary stance than Tricycle Magazine, with its advertisements for expensive meditation gear, for dharmic dating services, dharmic dentists and accountants, and its implicit authorization of the entrepreneurial and commercial activities of countless dharma centers and self-styled Buddhist masters. The packaging of mindfulness in programs such as MBSR is, I would suggest, a variant of the same theme. Could it be that this socially conservative ideology is tied to the particular ideological strand in modern Buddhism that I am identifying with perennialism? Arguments to this effect, or to similar effect, have been made by, among others, Hannah Ardent, and Emmanuel Levinas, but perhaps most relevant is the so-called critical Buddhism movement of Japan uh, in the 1990s. The leaders, and actually the sole members of this movement, Hakamaya Noriaki and Matsumoto Shiro, um, held that the ethical failings of Japanese Buddhism, notably their complicity, it was the complicity of the Buddhist, major Buddhist schools um, in the militarist and nationalist fever that led up to the Pacific War, uh, that they could be traced in part to the theory of intrinsic Buddha nature. Their argument, in short, is that the East Asian Buddhist tradition largely abandoned the more analytical and critical dimensions of Indian Mahayana, aligning itself instead with Buddha nature doctrine, and this led to a kind of ethical, social, and political passivity. Now, this is not the place to weigh in on this issue, except to note that this critique, too, emerges from within the Buddhist tradition, not from without. To conclude, it is my impression that many of the psychologists, cognitive scientists, and sociologists doing research on Burmese-style meditation practice seem to assume that the psychological benefits of such practice is borne out by centuries of Buddhist experience. But such simply is not the case. To the extent that the modern approach to mindfulness can be found in pre-modern Asia, it seems to have been a minority uh, position that was often met with criticism from more traditional quarters. The nature of the criticism warrants our attention as it parallels criticism directed against Mahasi's technique in modern Southeast Asia. Thus, we hear the charge that such practices emphasize momentary states rather than long-term transformation, that they do not yield the benefits that are claimed on their behalf, that they are more Hindu than Buddhist, and that the overriding emphasis on inner stillness in the absence of critical intellectual engagement with the teachings can lead to what the Zen tradition has called meditation sickness, a paralyzing state of introversion or self-absorption. To be clear, I'm not claiming that mindfulness does not have therapeutic value. I'm perfectly aware of the growing body of data that suggests it does. But my own experience among long-term meditators in Asian monastic settings, as well as in American practice centers, leads me to be somewhat skeptical. And I sometimes wonder if researchers in this area are asking the right questions of the right people. It's not just that advanced meditation practitioners in more traditional Asian settings may not exhibit the kinds of behavior that we associate with mental health. It is that, as Obersekera noted in the quote that I began with, it is not clear that they aspire to our model of mental health in the first place. And this, I submit, is the real challenge for those interested in the causal connections 
between Buddhist meditation and the psychological and behavioral outcomes that such meditation is supposed to produce. Thank you. Thank you.